Thank you very much. I'm Bruce Weinberg, and I'm excited to uh, be here this morning and be able to introduce our next set of speakers, who are Carlos Castro and Chris Lucas. Um, Carlos uh, got his, uh, I should say, Carlos and Chris are both Buckeyes through and through. Carlos got his bachelor and master's degree here, got his PhD in mechanical engineering from MIT. Um, did a postdoc at the uh, Technical Institute of Munich before returning back to OSU in 2011, where he is an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and a faculty member in OSU's biophysics graduate program. His focus is on developing nano uh, devices for biomedical applications, including DNA-based nanosensors. And Chris Lucas, is uh, also a Buckeye um, and his undergraduate studies here in biochemistry and his graduate work in the biomedical sciences graduate program. He's a research scientist um, working with Chris, um, working with Carlos and his focus is on developing novel DNA origami nanostructures for biomedical applications. Um, I heard, had the opportunity to hear both of them uh, speak at a um, COVID invent innovators showcase earlier this year, um, and they're doing truly fascinating work. Um, I, I'll, I'll let them talk about it, uh, but I'll, I'll say that, that it, it left me unhinged. Um, once, uh, once you hear the talk, hopefully that'll uh, make more sense. And it's equally impressive because I know they both have small children and did all this work in, in you know very tight time frame um, with, with all that going on. Um, and they're joined also by uh, Patrick Haley, who, um, who also um, is, is in uh, their lab. So I'm gonna turn it over to Carlos to, uh, to talk about their work. Great, thank you, Bruce. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen uh, and hopefully everyone can see my slides in the slide mode now. Um, but yeah, so I, I, it's my pleasure to be here today uh, as thanks Bruce for the nice introduction and, and also thanks to the organizers uh, for the opportunity to share some of our work with you. Uh, as, as Bruce mentioned, I'm, I'm Carlos Castro. I'm presenting on behalf of our technical team that's been working on developing a rapid COVID-19 diagnostic uh, based on a DNA origami nano device. And the rest of that team includes uh, Patrick Halley, Malika Shah Hosseini, and uh, Dr. Chris Lucas. Uh, I'll come back and say a little bit more about them uh, later in the talk. Uh, but really what I'm going to tell you about is uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the general research that we've been doing in my lab uh, and kind of over the last year or really the last you know nine, 10 months, how we've pivoted uh, into developing devices uh, for COVID-19 rapid diagnostics. Uh, and uh, you already heard kind of my, my stat rundown. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, but just uh, to share again, I am a Buckeye through and through uh, I fully ingrained in the OSU culture, even had the, the lucky opportunity to play sports at Ohio State when I was an undergraduate student. I played soccer uh, back in from 2000 to 2002. Uh, a couple other quick things. I was I'm originally from El Salvador. I was born there, but I grew up mostly in Ohio. Uh, and as Bruce mentioned, this, this pivot uh, included, you know, kind of changing or, or adjusting research directions, but also, uh, you know, trying to work on developing diagnostic devices mixed in with uh, you know, homeschooling a second grader and a kindergartner. So that, that also added to the challenge, but also kind of added to the, to the excitement and the general craziness that was uh, 2020. Um, so I also wanted to introduce uh, just our lab overall, you know, who are we? Uh, I'm in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. 
our lab or our research team consists of a research scientist is uh, Dr. Chris Lucas, who you'll hear from later, a uh, research engineer, Patrick Halley, who has been, you know, played a critical role in this uh, development of this diagnostics project and, and several other uh, biomedical application projects. Uh, we currently have three postdoctoral researchers, 10 graduate students and, and three undergraduate students. Um, one of the things we're very proud of and I think has been a big part of the impact we've been able to make in DNA nanotechnology and, uh, and application spaces is we're an interdisciplinary lab, a pretty diverse lab, uh, both uh, having you know, many different kinds of engineers in the lab, mechanical, biomedical, and chemical engineers, uh, but we also have biophysicists, biochemists, um, and even, you know, even a biologist, uh, Chris, Chris is kind of our resident biologist uh, that, that teaches us everything we need to know about biology uh, when we're trying to implement these devices. Uh, we also have a pretty diverse group representing many different countries, um, which again, I think it contributes to the culture of our group and our impact. And, you know, I think it's, it's uh, makes for a very enjoyable uh, work environment and research environment. Um, so what we what we do in terms of our research focus is really the core of our lab is advancing the mechanical functionality of DNA structures, uh, and the applications we're interested in are nano robotics. Uh, so one of our major focuses I'll show you just quickly as some highlights of making reconfigurable devices that can respond to the environment or maybe to you know externally applied cues to reconfigure and manipulate other materials. We're of course interested in biomedical applications. Um, I'll show just again a quick highlight of some drug delivery work uh, that we're working towards, uh, and, and of course the, the, the diagnostic in the biomedical space. And we're interested also in biophysics and bioengineering applications, where we may be taking these devices and using them to probe uh, biomolecular structures or maybe interface with uh, you know biomolecules or other materials uh, for engineering applications. Uh, and I wanted to start by introducing this kind of overall technique that we use uh, just to give you some understanding of really how we make these DNA devices. So the, the technique we use is called coded DNA origami, where we have two main components that go into these devices. One is what we, what we refer to as a scaffold strand. Uh, that's a long template strand uh, that's typically seven to 8,000 nucleotides or bases long. Um, and that the important part uh, is that we know the full sequence of that strand. And so that allows us to design other sequences that are complementary to that strand. For example, we can design the blue sequence that's complementary to the blue part of the scaffold strand here. Same thing, red sequence that's complementary to the red and the green sequence that's complementary to the green. And the trick of this scaffolded DNA origami approach is that we stitch these sequences together that we just designed this red blue and green sequence all together onto the same strand. This is what we, we refer to as a staple strand. When we mix this scaffold strand and the staple strand together, the only way for that scaffold strand to fold to that continuous staple strand is for it to fold up into some more compact topology or some more compact shape in order to co-localize this red, blue, and green regions of the scaffold that have to bind to this one continuous staple strand. And we refer to this as a staple strand because quite literally, we're taking these distant regions of the template strand and stapling them together to drive this higher order folding into some compact shape. And this approach was first demonstrated by Paul Rudimund uh, back in 2006. You see here some of the first structures that he published. In particular, this smiley face is kind of one of the iconic images illustrating really the geometric complexity that you can achieve on this kind of 10 to 100 nanometer scale, which is a really uh, perfect scale if you want to interact with biomolecules or biomolecular complexes. Um, and then in 2009, uh, William Shee's lab, this Douglas et al. paper extended this uh, to make very complicated three-dimensional structures. And so this is a highlight of some of the work that we do in the lab. We've, we are in a mechanical engineering department, so we try to bring an engineering design perspective and really focus on how can we implement ideas from say machine design or robot design. Um, and these are some examples that we've developed over the years that you see here of things that have well-defined rotational motion like a hinge and actually hinge we'll come back to. This is really the basis of our, <coughs> excuse me, of our diagnostic device. But we can also create all kinds of uh, uh, complex mechanisms that have two-dimensional or three-dimensional motion 
again, really kind of formalizing from an engineering design perspective. Uh, we're also interested in biomedical applications. Um, I'll actually start with the example on the right. What you see on the right, hopefully, is uh, these are DNA nanostructures that have been taken up by cells. You can see they're labeled with a, a red fluorophore. Um, you can see, you know, some of them statically inside the cells, but some of them even diffusing around or, you know, moving around inside of the cells. Um, and so we're interested in using these nanoparticles for drug delivery. And so that's why, you know, we do spend a lot of time understanding how they interact with cells and how they're taken into cells and even, you know, can we target specific cell types, things like that. Um, we're also interested in, uh, uh, from a biomedical standpoint, probing or manipulating cell-cell interactions. So we spent some time, as you see on the left, uh, developing ways to embed these DNA nano devices onto live cell membranes. And that allows us to control cell-cell adhesion or probe cell-cell adhesion, for example, potentially the forces that are experienced between cells. Um, and one of the goals we have is eventually applying this, for example, for endothelial cell-cell interactions on a vessel wall you know, to probe what are the forces and, and can we manipulate processes uh, of materials or cells or molecules that need to pass through that barrier. Um, another major focus of our lab is in biophysics and bioengineering applications. So this is sort of building on this nanorobotics and nanomechanical design of devices. Here I'm showing uh, this is a magnetically actuated uh, DNA microscale hinge. Um, so here we've actually added these kind of micron scale levers onto this nanoscale hinge so that we can attach a magnetic bead. And then we apply a magnetic field, it can open and close this hinge. And this gives us a nice simple handle that we can manipulate this hinge. And, and one of the goals is eventually to put some biomolecules in here to, to use this as a mechanical testing platform. Um, we can align and, and control other, other types of particles, for example, nanoparticles. Um, that again can be used in you know either biological or maybe nano manufacturing or materials applications. Um, and another focus that has developed over the last several years is using these devices to probe the biophysics of molecules. And, and one focus is in studying nucleosomes and other uh, chromosome uh, you know structures, underlying structures, uh, probing their structure and dynamics. Uh, this is a collaboration that has grown up with a couple other researchers in, in the OSU physics program, Michael Porio and Ralph Bunchu. Uh, to leverage the mechanical properties and the structural properties of these DNA devices. Um, so that that was that's kind of a highlight of our you know lab expertise over, that we've developed over the last ten years or so. Um, and about you know nine months ago, or I guess in, in in March or April, we really started thinking about you know how can we use that experience, or you know what kind of contribution or impact can we make on the pandemic, right? Post uh, uh, one, for one reason, I'll come back to this later, because we, we want to make an impact, but also, you know, our lab was shut down, and so we had a lot of time to think about, you know, what we potentially do. Um, and so that brought us to this uh, underlying, uh, the development of this technology and kind of the concept for a future company in this that we, that we're tentatively calling this dynamic nanobot assays and technologies, where the kind of mission statement is to use nanotechnology to find solutions to clinical based problems. Right, and we use the acronym DNA there uh, because of course these nanotechnologies are gonna be DNA focused. And so this is our technical team. Uh, I mentioned them earlier, but I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time introducing them now. Patrick is a, a researcher. He's a research associate in the lab. Uh, he actually worked in our lab also as an undergraduate student and a master's student uh, getting his bachelor's and master's degree in chemical engineering. Uh, then went away to work at Patel for uh, a couple years and I convinced him to come back. Uh, and he has really been essential with Chris in driving uh, many of the biomedical applications, including diagnostics and delivery um, over the last you know, eight, nine, 10 years. Um, Melika is a PhD candidate in mechanical engineering. Uh, so she's been, driving, she's been a key driver of many of our cellular applications, uh, both in sensing and cellular systems uh, and sensing at the molecular scale uh, within tissue, you know, sort of uh, living living system model environments. Excuse me. Um, so uh, she came on board and has really been driving a lot of experiments to develop nano sensors. Uh, and Chris is uh, Dr. Chris is a research scientist in the lab. Uh, he did his postdoc with me and, and sort of a joint postdoc in our collaboration with the. Uh, Leukemia Research Group, uh, John Bird and other researchers in the Leukemia Research Group in the Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, and Chris, again, has been a key driver uh, for many of our 
biomedical and bioengineering applications, uh, both thinking about, you know, how do we use DNA origami and diagnostic and potentially therapeutic applications, but also in thinking about how, how can we use these nanostructures to maybe probe mechanisms uh, of disease at the cellular level. And so you'll hear a little bit more from Chris uh, later in the talk. Um, and so coming back to our initial stages of this pivot, right? Last March, of course, uh, you know, just after spring break, everything closed down. Uh, you know, we had to transition. I mean, for, I, I was, I was uh, we were transitioning the lab. The lab closed down without much notice. Um, we had all these useful skills and tools and just couldn't get in the lab to do stuff. So we started thinking about, you know, how could we apply these existing tools to new problems? And of course, everyone, you know, the, the, the pandemic was uh, front and center on our minds. Um, and the two potential things that, that we thought our expertise could contribute to uh, were vaccines, right? One is vaccines, but those are complicated and slower to develop. Uh, you know, many, many people probably had a, a bigger head start and in general probably would take a significantly larger amounts of money uh, that we didn't have just to kind of start up a new project. Um, you know, so we, felt that maybe wasn't so feasible, at least on a short-term scale. Um, although we are working, currently working on vaccines that you know, we hope to develop over the course of the next couple of years. Um, and then the second area that we thought we can make an impact on was diagnostics, which in our minds were uh, more quickly accessible. And we really had a way to design these devices that could respond to their environment. Right? And so we just needed to figure out, you know, how do we translate that into a sensor that can detect some material uh, from you know, so the SARS-CoV-2 uh, coronavirus. And the way we thought about that is, you know, we've been thinking about actuation for many, many years in the context of nanorobotics, designing these systems that can respond to molecules in the environment, right? Where traditionally our goal has been to reconfigure that device, to drive the motion of that device, right? But now we, the way we're thinking about it is we're going to use that reconfiguration to create some measurable readout in response to some specific target molecule. Right? And that target molecule is nucleic acid. That's the way we've been doing our actuation for many years, or one of the ways we've been doing it. Uh, and it's the, the you know, way that's ideally suited uh, for detecting the coronavirus genomic material. Right? And we're using this DNA strand displacement uh, approach where we have some uh, DNA duplex that contains a target binding region. So this, this blue and red combined strand is really, that's kind of the antisense strand that's going to detect our target. This is the target strand, which we call our displacing strand. That displacing strand has this extra region of complementarity with the antisense strand, so it can bind there. That's what's called a toehold. So that's where it sort of first gains a foothold in, in interacting with this duplex. And then through this process of DNA strand displacement and branch migration, this incumbent strand or the displacing strand can eventually uh, replace this initial uh, uh, strand in the duplex uh, because it does ultimately have more, more base pairs. So that is ultimately a favored state. Um, and eventually you release this initial strand and you have this new duplex formed with the combined blue and red sequences. And this DNA strand displacement approach uh, was first introduced back in, in 2000 to reconfigure smaller DNA devices, but was applied to DNA origami first back in 2009 uh, on this DNA origami box where they used it to open and close this lid. And you can see here, this is the, a similar kind of duplex interaction with this toehold where we introduce, this is, sorry, not from our group. This is a group at Aarhus University uh, in Denmark that, that developed this. Um, where they introduce these keys that first bind to the toehold, right, displace the strand, and then they can open the slid, and that, that is read out by this uh, a fret based signal. It's basically you can see the, the spectra changes, or if you measure the uh, fluorescence intensity of this red floor for um, as it opens, these can no longer transfer energy, so you see a reduction in that red signal. Um, so this is indicative of that closing this uh, reduction in fluorescence here. And this is actually very similar to the fluorescence readout that we're using for our diagnostic purpose. Um, and so we have also implemented this DNA strand displacement approach in our lab to reconfigure DNA-based devices. Uh, this is uh, what's called a Bennett linkage. It's kind of a complex uh, a device that exhibits this complex three-dimensional motion. Uh, but we've used the same approach where we first have this kind of open structure 
we can introduce these DNA strands to close that structure up into a compact state. And then we use this DNA strand displacement approach to open that structure back up. And you can see here, in this case, it's a fluorophore quencher readout, which is uh, uh, the same. Uh, we're actually using a fluorophore quencher readout on our diagnostic device. Um, you can see that process occurs within the time scale of a few minutes, right, with a time constant of about a minute. Um, and this is essentially exactly what we need, right? We need a, a reconfigurable DNA device that can respond to nucleic acid in, in the solution right, and provide some measurable signal. Um, and again, we're thinking about it in the context of robotics, uh, but this was really what, why we were set up uh, to nicely think about uh, developing a device for diagnostics. And, and this kind of brings us to our initial concept design, right? We have the capability to build these complex two-dimensional, three-dimensional structures, but we thought of, okay, what's the, the relatively simplest DNA device that we can use to reconfigure in response to uh, some COVID-19 genomic material, you know, COVID-19 RNA. Uh, and this is the design we came up with, this kind of hinge. And you, you heard uh, Bruce mentioning he was unhinged and, and, and that's exactly, you know, how we do the detection where this hinge is initially closed. Once it detects the, the COVID-19 RNA through a DNA strand displacement process, uh, it can open up this latch and that allows the hinge to open. Another nice feature of these DNA origami structures is you can place many functional molecules on them. In this case, we're doing fluorophore and quenchers. And because these structures are, are relatively big, right, they contain hundreds of these DNA staple strands that I mentioned, we have the opportunity to place potentially hundreds, but even at least tens of these fluorophore quencher molecule interactions, which is really key in this diagnostic readout. And I think that's what's going to allow us to create a very large a uh, strong measurable signal, you know, just for a single detection event. Um, so, you know, we have this concept and the, of course the first question is, you know, we can do this, but could this provide some potential advantage over the existing methodologies? And of course the gold standard is the reverse transcriptase uh, PCR uh, uh, approach. And so this is a, a very reliable process, but it's relatively slow. Right? This often takes you know many many hours, and sometimes in some cases turnaround times are you know days or a day or more. Um, the materials needed are scarce, right? There's a lot of, there's enzymes involved here, right, which can sometimes cause uh, sourcing problems and backlogs. Uh, the collection method is intrusive, although more recently I think people are doing more saliva-based uh, uh, testing, right? This uh, NP, the nasopharyngeal sam sample collection is not very. Uh, pleasant as a patient if you've had to do that. Um, and one of the key things, again, differentiating from our device, this relies on amplifying the target material, which is nucleic acid. And so you have this, this pipeline of extraction, isolation, um, and then the cDNA synthesis, and then the, the actual PCR. And then eventually you get to the readout stage right after you're amplifying this nucleic acid material. Right? But because of the need to amplify the, the target material to carry out this PCR reaction uh, that can take time, and that also takes, you know, some kind of relatively expensive instrumentation to actually carry out uh, uh, the, that PCR reaction. And so, just uh, thinking about comparing, uh, you know, what, what are the other emerging technologies? I already mentioned the PCR. It's of course accurate and positive. Uh, test indicates a current infection, right? Those are the two primary things that make it the gold standard but it is slow and it's labor intensive and, and may require materials that, that, that can be a short supply. There's of course the rapid antigen tests, uh, also test for an active infection, uh, but the accuracy is limited, right? And that's why these are not used uh, as widely for purely diagnostic purposes, um, right? The, the, these accuracy is significantly lower than the PCR tests. And then there's the antibody tests, which are also fast but those do not test necessarily for an active infection. Um, this just indicates that the patient had, and then had uh, uh, you know, the um, SARS-CoV-2 or they've been exposed to that virus previously. Um, other emerging testing methods, there's iso, you know, isothermal, which sort of simplifies the need for some instrumentation, uh, but these, uh, the, the design of these can still be difficult. Um, and they still can, can take time, right? And so this uh, also has limitations with regard to multiplexing. Uh, and CRISPR methods uh, have the advantage of uh, being able to be carried out at constant temperature, low temperature. 
um, but these have many hands-on steps and, and the manufacturing path takes time. Um, and I think the cost uh, may also be an issue with some of these CRISPR-based methodologies. Um, and so our device really, we think can address some of these challenges uh, because one of the main features is, is that it's pretty simple. It's a single device that exhibits two states, right? And, and all it needs to do is be exposed to that material right? and it's, uh, 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 you know, exhibits uh, on or off state, right? It's either closed or open. And we expect this large readout signal upon the, the binding. Um, and so that, that's what really allows us to be a rapid, cheap and portable system that we think ultimately this test could, could be carried out pretty much anywhere. Um, and so comparing specifically relative to the gold standard, uh, right on the, on the left here, our main advantage is we think in the turnaround time where rather than you know, many hours uh, for, for carrying out that diagnostic, we can achieve that within uh, you know, tens of minutes. Uh, and, and also in terms of the active time where a technician might be needing to work with that system or that diagnostic, right? We could reduce that significantly also you know, from an hour, hours to a few minutes. Um, hopefully while still maintaining the same accuracy because we're using very specific, you know, DNA uh, nucleic acid sequence interactions. Um, relative to the antigen testing, of course, I think we'll have the advantage on accuracy again, because we are using very specific nucleic acid interactions, um, but then have the advantage on the turnaround time. So uh, coming back to really the, the comparing to the gold standard here, um, we have, you know, this is the, the typical workflow where you have sample collection, RNA extraction, and it's really this RNA isolation and all the way through the PCR that takes many hours to get to the readout, where in our case, we think we can eliminate, you know, the need for all of these steps that are kind of, uh, uh, you know, carrying out or supporting the PCR and really just go directly from that RNA extraction to, you know, mixing with the devices to, and getting directly to the readout. Uh, and again, the key reason there is because we can amplify the signal per detection event as opposed to first amplifying the materials uh, and then getting to many, many materials with you know, little signal per, uh, you know, per target molecule. Um, and so this is really what our product looks like, right? This is our, our hinge. Um, I, I'm not showing the full detail here uh, just for simplicity, but this is you know, basically the idea we have this hinge that has a bunch of fluorophores and quencher molecules. Uh, I mentioned this is roughly the same size. The arms here are, you know, 50, 60 nanometers, where the, you know, the full size of the virus is about 100 nanometers. Um, this is, uh, we, we have many fluorescent molecules here to provide a, provide a strong signal per copy of the virus. Um, and then uh, kind of the, the, the real uh, intricate design features are in this latching mechanism. So I'm not going to go into the details of that. And that's really what we've been working on, uh, getting a, a very uh, robust and, and sensitive latching mechanism over the last several months. Um, and we did file a provisional patent on this technology back in early October. Um, and so this is, a, a, I'm going to walk you through some of the development steps. I'm moving a little bit slower here than I had planned to, but um, that's okay. Uh, so again, what we want is this device that we can latch and then can unlatch in response to this particular target molecule and then give a robust fluorescent signal. And so we envision that our workflow would be, you know, we have these uh, devices either lyophilized or in some high density solution. We can directly take this sample with COVID-19 RNA, mix it in, and then go directly to readout without needing to amplify that material. And we envision that workflow could take, you know, tens of minutes, you know, hopefully 30 minutes or less. Um, and so kind of the steps of our development were really the design. Uh, this is, we, we designed this in a custom software called CAD Nano that again was developed by Sean Douglas out of William Shee's lab a little over a decade ago. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this design process, but this is kind of the blueprint for this hinge device. And these lines are actually representing either the scaffold strand in black or the red and green are those staple strands. Um, I'll probably skip this in the interest of time, uh, but we, we have actually developed a design software out of our lab for these types of devices that's called Magic DNA. Uh, there are tutorials on YouTube and it's available online. You know, if you're interested in uh, using these devices, of course, I'm happy to talk about collaboration, but if you want to look into potentially designing things yourself, um, this new software is pretty user friendly. Um, so I'm happy to, to provide that or provide the links for that. If you're interested, feel free to reach out. Um, then how we fabricate the, the sensor, this is actually just an animation that was also developed by Sean Douglas, at, who's now at UCSF. Um, this is not a simulation, it just shows 
kind of a, a picture of what the self-assembly process might look like where we have all these staple strands in solution. Um, those guys bind to their designated binding pockets on the scaffold strand and eventually pinch that scaffold together into some compact shape. Um, and then in this case, a rectangle, of course, in our case, this would be a hinge device. The way that's typically carried out is on a PCR machine, right? This is often carried out at, you know, these small scale reactions uh, that can take, you know, hours up to several days. One of the things that, that actually uh, Patrick Halley, who's also working on the stop diagnostic project has led for us over the last several years is scaling this fabrication. So we've, we have come up with ways to scale this fabrication, which of course will be critical, uh, uh, you know, to um, roll out this diagnostic. Uh, and now we're able to scale you know, basically, you know, hundreds or thousands of fold uh, with using pretty cheap and widely available equipment. And we can fold these things in the time scale of an hour as opposed to several days. Uh, I won't go into the details of that. That is published. We published that just a little over a year ago. Um, so you can take a look at that if you're interested. But the main point is we have these capabilities to scale the fabrication to support rolling out this diagnostic. Uh, and our first stage of evaluation Right. Once we perform that self-assembly reaction, this is what, what uh, typical results look like in gel electrophoresis. Uh, it's often very sensitive to the concentration of counter ions in solution. So we do test a range of counter ions. We have that scaffold source material as reference. Right? And then here we typically include a tenfold excess of these staple strands during the fabrication. And you can see here the process range of magnesium concentrations. These all look folded pretty well. This sharp band is actually the well-folded structure. Uh, we can excise that band uh, or we can purify different ways. And then we image by transmission electron microscopy and you can see you know, high, high quality, high yield folding of these hinge devices. Um, and now we can kind of take that through really testing for our diagnostic. Um, and so what we've been able to show so far is this is effectively constructed. We are able to latch that with a target with a, a duplex interaction, DNA base pairing action that includes the antisense for this uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And we have also been able to demonstrate that we can open this device. So this is the key conformational change that provides our readout in response to uh, this uh, RNA sequence uh, from the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, you can also see that here we see it by electron microscopy. Here we see it by gel electrophoresis. And um, we do have preliminary results on our fluorescence readout this is with just a single floor four quencher pair. Um, so you see this doubling of signal, but we expect this to provide a much more robust and, and bright signal uh, once we have many, many floor fours on there. Uh, I won't spend time on this, but we also have demonstrated uh, this is a specific response of the sensor when we provide an off-target gene, uh, it does not open. Um, and so you know that's just, uh, we, we are able to confirm the specificity of that sensing. Um, and one of the things uh, what, you know, one of our key next steps, of course, is then moving to clinical samples. And we have engaged collaborators in, in the medical school to provide uh, clinical samples uh, for us that we hope to do in the next few months. Uh, we're also currently optim working on optimizing this fluorescent signal so we can test effects of, you know, where these four four quencher pairs are. Before we start adding, you know, many of these onto the hinge, we can just understand some of the parameters to optimize this fluorescent signal. That's one of the things we're currently working on. Um, and so uh, that, that's kind of the, the end of the, the research part, but I just wanted to point out, uh, you know, this has really opened up new exciting opportunities that we wouldn't have been able to access. And in particular, I wanna highlight this support from the Office of Research, because uh, we just kind of started with an idea um, back in March and we decided to apply for this Office of Research funding, um, which, you know, thankfully we got. And that's really what allowed us to, to, to take on this you know, pursuing this diagnostic uh, research project. Um, without that, you know, we had the ideas, but of course, if you have ideas without money, that that is hard to, to make anything work. And so that that seed funding was really allow, allowed us to start this project. Um, we've also uh, applied for this uh, third front, Ohio Third Frontier Accelerate Award, which is pending, uh, which we're hopeful uh, can you know we're we're hopeful that we'll receive that in the next month or two. And we also applied for this NSF uh, Partnership for Innovation Award that again supports uh, rolling out research in, you know, through commercialization. And these grants have uh, been foundational to the research and really have been the product of a close interaction with other folks at OSU, including our corporate engagement office uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, 
mainly folks in the corporate engagement office and, and Art Gure, I think played a big role in supporting this NSF. Uh, he's kind of a liaison between the corporate engagement office and the College of Engineering. Uh, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Chris Lucas, who can actually tell you a little bit more uh, about the, the aspects of you know, how we've been trying to move towards commercialization with this pivot towards diagnostics. Great, thank you very much, Carlos, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to the organizers to be here today to present our work, and thanks, Carlos, for the amazing opportunity um, to, to work in your lab on this exciting project. So um, good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Lucas, a research scientist working with Carlos and Dr. John Bird in the Cancer Center. Um, my role, as Carlos mentioned in our COVID-19 diagnostic testing efforts, is to serve as a liaison between our technical team and our commercialization partners, which we've met uh, most all of them uh, this year, you know, in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Um, I've been at Ohio State for a little while now, almost uh, getting towards 18 years. I did all my training here, um, Buckeye through and through. Uh, I, the background of biomedical science has kind of allowed me, as Carlos mentioned, to be the resident biologist in a, in a nanoengineering and mechanical engineering laboratory, which has been wonderful to try to, to, to bridge the gap between engineering and medicine. Um, I've been in three colleges over my career here at Ohio State. Um, I love to spend out time outdoors, hunting, fishing, wildlife management with my family. And yeah, I'm excited to teach my now three-year-old son uh, all about science, great outdoors, and especially Buckeye football, uh, and to have a short memory. So, you know, the 2021 season begins today. So we'll just move forward. Um, and thanks to Buckeyes and, and Coach Day for a great year. So. If you could please advance, Carlos, thank you. Um, so yeah, as Carlos mentioned, the grants uh, mentioned uh, that, that we've been you know, fortunate to, to apply and, and get favorable reviews on has been necessary for providing the proof of concept support uh, to turn that COVID-19 diagnostic testing platform idea to a commercially viable product. So and none of this would be possible, uh, of course, without the support of our colleagues at first at the OSU Corporate Engagement Office, as Carlos mentioned, uh, Drs. Art Gure, Kate Schuhaus, our, our licensing manager, I'll talk about in, in, in just a second, a little bit more, Janelle Ezel and Cheryl Turnbull, who helped us tremendously in terms of identifying funding uh, to, to, to go after, but also helping us prepare um, the, those applications, especially from uh, the commercialization perspective, which we've had no prior experience with. Uh, so as, as uh, do, uh, Dr. Jackson began the session saying, you know, truly team science is, is, is what makes this all possible. And I, I couldn't agree more um, coming from a technical background and now starting to learn the commercialization pathway uh, process has been, you know, in, instrumental for me to realize that, you know, it takes many, many, many people with unique perspective, uh, unique expertise um, to synergize with a technical team uh, to create something wonderful to move hopefully to market. So, um, so yeah, just, just a little bit more about our commercialization team. The key members, Dr. Janelle Ezel has helped us file two provisional patents. Uh, one uh, is, is, is actually at the uh, published phase. We, 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 we course on the COVID-19 biosensor uh, this year, but also our targeted drug delivery device in collaboration with Dr. Bird was filed in 2018 and published in 2020. Um, it was uh, Kate, Dr. Kate uh, Schuhaus at the corporate engagement office that connected us with Nu Yang Hu, um, our uh, commercialization mentor. Um, an entrepreneurial mentor as we move towards hopefully a startup company, a director at Rev1. We meet with Moo on a biweekly basis and she's been instrumental in our commercialization um, development, uh, developmental process of the platform. It was Moo that connected us with Sean McKibben, uh, a local healthcare executive. And, and it, Sean's been uh, phenomenal in terms of allowing us to, to think big and, and to think outside the box in terms of the market potential of, of our technology. And about a year ago, uh, Dr. J uh, uh, General, as, well, as well as the Corporate Engagement Office uh, colleagues connected us with Dr. Jeff Spisner, who is our business lead, uh, local biotech entrepreneur. And, and Jeff has been absolutely essential for our development um, of, the, of the technology uh, with the support scientifically, as well as during the entire steps of the, of the commercialization process. So it's a, it's a wonderful team. We're, we're learning a ton and excited to move forward. So yeah, if you could advance, Carlos, please. Thank you. So in terms of the, uh, the potential, the commercialization potential of our technology itself, it's up fast, as Carlos mentioned, scalable fabrication takes on the order of minutes to hours. Um, once the production is fully scaled, the nanostructures we believe will be very cost effective, estimated as low as 18 cents per milligram of material. Uh, molecular modifications are straightforward to employ, um, changing target and specificity uh, against other things, other targets in addition to SARS-CoV-2 RNA, 
will require, require minimal design change and rapid uh, uh, iteration and design. Uh, the platform is nuclease resistant and can be modified further um, if there is a need for greater sensitivity. Um, and other designs include a colorimetric and color changing diagnostic readouts uh, that are cur currently underway, but further uh, for, uh, uh, just starting in, in, in development. So we envision our minimum viable product as being the fluorescent based uh, nanobiosensor for a, a quencher fluorophore uh, system uh, to be for, for clinical use, but then moving towards rapid uh, point of care diagnostic screening uh, with calorimetric and color changing readouts as well. So if you could advance, thank you, Carlos. So uh, in terms of our value proposition, the key customer benefits of the platform, uh, a reliable, uh, uh, simple, uh, affordable, rapid COVID-19 diagnostic test um, with a much faster turnaround time uh, to the hopefully accurate results, of course, estimated 30 minutes compared to days, potentially with the PCR-based test in terms of turnaround, which will allow then for a much faster time to quarantine in, in a much safer environment. Uh, we envision low cost, five to $10 per diagnostic test will allow for more frequent testing and increase the numbers of tests administered 10 to 20 times more um, than the testing the same cost. So we envision that this platform will have a major impact on large open communities, such as college campuses, allowing for tens of thousands of student faculty and staff to be effectively, efficiently tested on a routine repeated basis necessary for, for safety, um, even after you know, taking the vaccine, of course. Um, so we envision a rapid point of care uh, COVID diagnostic test will, will allow for safe um, re-entry into society in the wake of this pandemic. And lastly, we, we, we envision our platform will enable rapid development and deployment of, of fast, low cost and low tech uh, point of care tests for viral pathogens and, and other tar targets at the, in globally, especially in underserved areas. In terms of market potential of the tech platform, um, we, we got our, uh, did some research recently in, 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 in collaboration with Rev1. Uh, this is all per the BCC report on 2020 on COVID-19 diagnostics. The total available market, which is the global market for COVID-19 molecular diagnostics is estimated to be a $48.9 billion market. Uh, the serviceable obtainable or uh, available market, the SAM, um, is the U.S. market for COVID-19 molecular diagnostics, estimated at uh, $21.2 billion with the CAGR a growth rate of 14.8% of, uh, estimated over the next six years, so a rapidly uh, growing market. And in terms of our serviceable obtainable market, estimated 2% of the U.S. market share on COVID-19 molecular diagnostics is at $260 million. It's important to note that our our technology platform specificity and biosensing is not limited to SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 disease. Um, again, our, our sequence in, in sensing nucleic acid uh, uh, capabilities and rapid repurposing is, is, a, is a prime advantage of our technology moving forward, we feel. In terms of commercialization plan, we're looking to launch a startup company uh, as opposed to out licensing because of the high level of expertise necessary to make these structures, design, construct, and scale. Um, execute quick and efficient design customization, uh, reevaluation and quality control, and create multiplexing assays. Uh, we envision uh, the capability to detect multiple targets at the same time, including SARS-CoV-2 and influenza nucleic acid material, so a co-detection assay, um, and, and even up to potentially three potential targets also. Um, our technical team then has a unique expertise and experience to execute the above items very quickly, efficiently, and, and cost-effectively. Uh, so the accelerator award that we, we mentioned, we believe will, will serve as a proof of concept foundation for EUA uh, from, from, from uh, the FDA and allowing for uh, launching a startup, uh, accessing, access to further capital and maximizing value to stakeholders. So we envision our, our access, our capital access for the startup company to come from negotiations with individual sub-license uh, contracts to, from, to pharmaceutical companies for distri distribution and distributors. Uh, Midwest and, and U.S.-based venture capital firms, as well as angel investors. So our long-term vision for our startup company is kind of a three-prong uh, three developmental pipeline approach. Uh, the first, of course, is our nanobiosensors leading to our diagnostic testing uh, direction with COVID-19, other, other uh, new and emerging viruses circulating, even circulating tumor DNA, uh, theoretically. Our nanotherapeutic angle, which is, of course, we, as I, we mentioned, we have a patent filed on multifunctional drug delivery and in the, in the, in focusing on AML in particular, but relevant to solid tumors also. 
uh, in collaboration with Dr. Bird. And then lastly, uh, we, we're envisioning a pipeline, a developmental pipeline, where we focus on research applications, uh, including single molecule applications for studies, biomolecules, and, and, and further imaging applications also. So briefly to summarize our DNA origami hinge, uh, SARS-CoV-2 biosensor is, a, a, we envision it to ultimately be a point of care diagnostic test. It's simple, two state on off switch, rapid in the order of 30 minutes to employ. It's reliable, uh, we believe it'll be a reliable estimated 95% accuracy, uh, estimated also to be very sensitive detecting down to approximately 100 copies of SARS-CoV-2 RNA um, per microliter and affordable uh, five to $10 per diagnostic test. Uh, we see the potential for everyday testing, um, especially in underserved areas, very importantly. And uh, lastly, again, it's we're not limited to detecting SARS-CoV-2 for, for uh, COVID-19. Um, quick design changes could allow us to detect influenza viruses, uh, as well as any DNA, bi and DNA or RNA-based virus and circulating tumor DNA. So once the initial design is established, It'll be basically like taking a Lego piece off of our biosensor and then placing the new uh, Lego piece on that will be the new uh, sensor for specificity. Uh, so with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you all for your attention. Um, I know it's it, it looks like that we're right at noon right now, but hopefully we have time for a few questions. Um, and thanks again for the opportunity and, and we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you all. I can't really don't see any questions in the Q and A. Um, if you do have any at this time, do you, will you please enter them into the chat or the Q and A? Um, if not, we'll give it a couple of moments, and if not, we can move on to the next presentation. Again, thank you guys for um, being willing to present today um, and sharing um, what you have been doing during this time. We truly appreciate your time and your effort in this. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so I think we're going to go ahead and move on to the next presenter so we can stay on track for the day. Um, if any questions come up, you guys can feel free to reach out to us and we can pass them on to the, um, the team here. All right, Cynthia, would you like to move forward? Sure, um, thank you. Um, as the uh, director of the KL2 program at the CCTS, I am uh, particularly excited to introduce one of our KL2 scholars. Um, who's done just, I think, a lovely job of doing a COVID pivot. Um, our next speaker will be uh, Brittany Hand, who's an assistant professor in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Her research centers on evaluating healthcare delivery processes and patient outcomes, and really focusing on health services research to study healthcare access, utilization, and costs at a population level. Um, I think the things that have really excited me about uh, learning more about Dr. Han's work is that she is really focused on translation um, to improve healthcare delivery by partnering and really doing key community stakeholder engagement to co-design solutions to overcome barriers to healthcare delivery, and then using an implementation science approach to study the effectiveness of these co-design solutions in real world settings. Uh, the project that she's currently working on is to generate evidence to improve primary care delivery for autistic adults as they transition from pediatric to adult health care systems. Uh, and I, it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Hand, who will be speaking on the effect of COVID-19 on one community-engaged research project and how we pivoted. And we'll turn it over now to you, Brittany. Hello, my name is Brittany Hand and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences in the College of Medicine. My research focuses on how we can make primary care more accessible for autistic adults. And today I'm going to share with you a presentation titled Effect of COVID-19 on One Community Engaged Research Project and How We Pivoted, a study of healthcare experiences and outcomes among autistic adults. Before we get started, I'd like to disclose some sources of support for the research and the a primary care clinic that I'll be discussing today. So the research is supported by a KL2 Career Development Award and an Adult Transition Research Award from Autism Speaks. 
The primary care clinic is supported by Bill and Marcy Ingram and the White Castle Foundation, as well as an award from Next for Autism. There are also a number of individuals who should be acknowledged for their contributions to this work. And that includes my KL2 mentorship committee, our clinic partners, and student members of my research team. I wanted to start by giving you a roadmap or overview of this talk. So I'll start by defining the scope of the problem, which is that autistic adults have difficulty accessing primary care. I'll then discuss one way that this problem is being addressed at Ohio State through the use of a specialized primary care clinic. I'll describe how our research team has proposed to evaluate whether or not this specialized clinic is effective. And last, I'll tell you about the changes we made to allow for ongoing research during COVID-19 pandemic. So let's jump right in with discussing the problem that my research addresses. First, we need to understand that autism is really common. There are actually 50,000 autistic individuals who turn 18 years old each year in the United States. It's so common that virtually everyone knows someone with autism, whether that's someone in your immediate family or someone you know more peripherally like extended family, friends, or neighbors. For me, that person is my cousin, Andrea, and she just turned 18 years old this year. And that's the thing about autistic children. They grow up and they become autistic adults. And this transition to adulthood is hard in a lot of ways for autistic individuals. And when it comes to healthcare in particular, I would argue that in most cases, this transition is broken. As I see it, there are two main reasons why this transition breaks down. The first has to do with healthcare providers. Research tells us that adult healthcare providers don't feel equipped to deliver care for autistic adults, and patients also feel that when they're interacting with these providers. A patient recently said to me, when I mentioned I have ADD and Asperger's, I'd be one of those people he wouldn't touch with a 22-foot pole when describing a past interaction he had with a healthcare provider. Another patient said, before I went to CAST, I, CAST is the primary care clinic that I'll be talking about. Before I went to CAST, I went to several other providers. It was very difficult to find somebody that would listen and would be patient enough. I mean, I had a doctor that basically kind of taunted me for not wanting to shake his hand. The other reason that this transition breaks down is the way that healthcare has become so standardized. In a lot of ways, this has been helpful to keep things moving and on time, but it can create extra barriers for autistic adults. For example, in discussing a clinic's 24-hour cancellation policy, a patient said, I don't know if I'll feel okay until the day of, and so then it's really hard if I need to change an appointment because I understand why doctors want 24 hours notice, but for me, that's not always a reasonable request. So at this point, you may be wondering what happens if these barriers to care are not overcome. Research tells us that over 30% of autistic adults have unmet physical or mental health care needs and that this population is at greater risk than the general population for premature death. Autistic adults are also more likely to experience an inpatient hospitalization and have higher overall health care costs than the general population. Since about one third of autistic adults have a co-occurring physical or mental health condition, it's really important that they get the health care they need to manage these conditions and prevent secondary complications, hospitalization, and premature death. So researchers like myself are beginning to look into ways that we can address some of these barriers to care. That includes taking steps to prepare a workforce of adult health care providers who are educated about autism and willing and capable of meeting this population's needs as well as trying to increase the personalization of healthcare delivery through accommodations that minimize barriers to care for this population. In my work, I've specifically been collaborating with Ohio State's Center for Autism Services and Transition, or CAST, which is a patient-centered clinic um, that was designed in partnership with autistic adults and their caregivers to minimize barriers to care. CAST differs from the standard primary care clinic in that patients have an initial intake appointment to identify accommodations that are necessary for care. For example, patients with sensory sensitivities may need to bypass the waiting room. Patients with high anxiety may need to stop by the office to familiarize themselves with the environment. Or it might be helpful for patients to watch a high fidelity video model prior to their formal medical appointment so they can be prepared for procedures like blood draws or having their blood pressure taken. Additionally, CAST differs from the standard medical home in that it has designated primary care physicians with extensive experience working with autistic youth and adults. And CAST currently has four primary care physicians, all of whom are board certified in internal medicine and pediatrics. These physicians have obtained knowledge about autism through interactions and formal educational sessions 
with developmental behavioral pediatricians and extensive experience in delivering care for this population. CAST also has a dedicated nurse and medical assistance, and all staff at CAST have participated in training sessions led by physicians or developmental and behavioral pediatricians. In addition to these trainings, the regular contact that CAST providers have with autistic individuals and their caregivers has been a key component to developing comfort and increasing care in delivering care for autistic adults. So in my funded studies, we sought to perform a comprehensive evaluation of CAST, as well as identify strategies for improving communication between autistic adults and their healthcare providers, since this is a widely reported barrier to care. So to examine continuity of care and preventive care utilization, we performed secondary analyses to compare CAST patients using data from OSU's information warehouse to national samples of autistic adults um, using national medical billing databases. These studies did reveal that CAST patients had better continuity of care and higher preventive service utilization than national samples of autistic adults. And I've included here some information um, citations for these studies if you'd like to know more about them. But since these were secondary analyses, uh, these research projects were not affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And then to examine um, satisfaction with care, we conducted a survey of CAST patients and caregivers of CAST patients. And our results revealed that the patients reported high levels of satisfaction with care and very few unmet healthcare needs. And this uh, survey was conducted before the pandemic. Last, we wanted to identify some strategies to improve communication between CAST patients and providers. And we had specifically planned to evaluate the current check-in process for clinic visits, since this often sets the stage for the rest of the communication between the patient and the provider. Our original aim was to design and implement a new check-in form for CAST patients to improve patient-provider communication. We planned to recruit six to eight individuals from each of the following stakeholder groups autistic adults, caregivers, speech language pathologists, and CAST providers. With these participants, we planned to develop new check-in forms through a collaborative and iterative process and a series of in-person focus groups. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the, clinical, um, the clinic had significantly reduced face-to-face -face or in-office visits, and that resulted in the current check-in form being used less often. Additionally, our planned in-person focus groups were no longer feasible, and our original aim would miss an opportunity to expand the body of research on the use of telehealth with this population. So currently, there are only a handful of studies that have examined the use of telehealth among autistic adults, and they've all focused on the reliability and validity of receiving an autism diagnosis done completely through telehealth. So we had the opportunity here to grow the literature by exploring the use of telehealth to deliver primary care. We modified our aim to instead identify opportunities to improve the telehealth experiences for autistic adults and their caregivers. And we recruited six CAST providers, six autistic adults, and 13 caregivers. And each of those individuals participated in a 20 to 40 minute semi-structured interview over the phone or by text message. We then performed a simple thematic analysis to identify potential targets for improvement efforts, as well as to summarize the advantages and disadvantages of using telehealth to deliver primary care for this population. Through our interviews, we learned that the telehealth process currently involves at least four steps. So first, the patient calls central scheduling where the scheduler determines if they need an in-person visit or a telehealth visit based on the reason for um, the appointment then the scheduler determines whether the patient has the technology available to facilitate a telehealth visit, and then ultimately the visit gets scheduled and information gets sent to the, uh, to the patient about how they will need to connect to the visit. Then anywhere from one week before the visit the, to the day of the visit, the patient will be contacted by registration to verify insurance information and date of birth. And then third, sometime during the day of the visit, the patient will be contacted by phone by a medical assistant. And they'll do something called virtual rooming, which consists of verifying the reason for the visit, current medications, and completing any needed questionnaires to prepare for the visit, like depression screenings or anxiety screenings. Last, the patient then actually has the visit with the provider. 
And our clinic partners have indicated that this virtual rooming process in particular um, only is completed successfully about 50% of the time. So we really wanted to understand why that was and try to identify some ways to improve this process. One recommendation uh, that we found from our research was to have the scheduler set clear expectations and explain to the patient that they will receive a call from registration and another call from a medical assistant uh, before their visit with the provider. And this um, will increase the chance of registration and virtual rooming telephone calls being answered if individuals know to expect a call. Additionally, some patients and caregivers recommended providing a video to walk them through the steps of the telehealth visit to make sure that the instructions, which are currently provided in writing, are more accessible, and this may ultimately reduce the number of uh, technology issues with the uh, telehealth visits. Another recommendation that we found was to have patients complete both the registration step and virtual rooming step through MyChart. So this would place a, uh, less of a burden on staff and medical assistants since they would not have to be placing these calls. And it would also reduce the number of steps for patients. About 95% of CAS patients have my chart, so this recommendation seems really feasible. Our interview data also revealed some advantages to the use of telehealth for providing primary care for autistic adults, which is a novel and valuable contribution to the existing autism literature. Participants noted that telehealth was safer, especially during the context of the pandemic. One patient said, it's safer because it's a contactless visit, so you're not around people that are sick. The telehealth experience was often more comfortable for patients than having them come to the clinic as well. One patient said, I don't like all the people roaming around and driving to and driving back, so telehealth is more relaxing for me. From the perspective of providers, the use of telehealth adds valuable context that a clinic-based appointment would not, and this can help the provider deliver higher quality, more effective care. One provider said, for example, they can follow the patient as they're walking through the home and explain that behavior, and you can say, wow, I see exactly what you're talking about now. Last, multiple participants commented on how convenient telehealth was since it could be completed in the patient's home. One caregiver said it was incredibly convenient because we live so far away from the office. We also found that there were some disadvantages to telehealth for this population. For example, some participants reported issues with internet connectivity or internet stability, which may reduce the accessibility of care. One caregiver said, our internet around here, the aerial sometimes, it cuts off and you don't have no frequency. And other participants noted that the use of telehealth provided new distractions for the patient, such as being able to see into the healthcare provider's home in the background, um, and or, or just being distracted by the use of the technology itself. One caregiver said it was harder for the patient. He was a lot more distracted. Last, some patients expressed concerns about the security and privacy of telehealth. One patient said, I don't feel as safe talking over telehealth as I do talking to my doctor in person. You don't know who could be around. So in summary, our adaptations to, due to COVID-19 allowed us to identify some actionable steps that this clinic can use to improve the telehealth experience for patients and their families. And it also allowed us to add to the growing body of literature on advantages and disadvantages of using telehealth to deliver healthcare for autistic adults. So to sum up, today we've covered the issues that autistic adults face with access to primary care, one possible solution to these barriers through a specialized um, uh, clinic for autistic adults, our research team's plan to conduct a comprehensive evaluation of the primary care facility and identify opportunities for improvement, and how we modified our research question in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much, Brittany. That was a uh, terrific, terrific talk. And I guess I'm wondering if you've thought about how what you've learned can be extended to other patient populations? Yeah, so um, the clinic that we are partnering with, CASC, has said that they, um, if we can find some strategies that would be easy for them to implement with this population, they'd be very willing to roll this out to everyone that they see um, at this uh, facility in Hilliard. So the so CAST is actually only um, a subset of providers at this particular 
um, OSU location. And so um, there's definitely a potential to, for example, combining the registration and the virtual rooming on my chart, that could be something that could very easily be implemented with all of their telehealth visits. I love that. And then we have a question in the chat <coughs> saying, you know, what do you think the prospects for telehealth are going forward after the pandemic? That's a tricky question. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure. I have um, read a lot of, of opinion pieces that are out there that uh, folks think that um, telehealth will definitely have a much bigger presence in healthcare than it did prior to the pandemic. Um, I, I definitely know for this population of autistic adults, there are a lot of advantages to it for um, you know kind of more routine visits like medication management, those kinds of things. So, um, and the, the clinic that we're working with has said that they also foresee it being a much larger part of their practice even post pandemic. Interesting. And I, I like the comment about distractions in the background of the uh, provider, which made me think more about <laughs> My virtual background and you know things that we should think about that I would normally would not really think about at all. Right. So that was really an interesting comment. Are there any other comments either in the chat or anyone else have a question they'd like to raise? And I guess the last point I'll make here is Brittany, I, my understanding when we spoke before is it seemed like your enrollment was actually going faster than you had anticipated. Um, due to the pivot. You want to comment on that at all? Because I thought that was so interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, so we hadn't actually started trying to recruit for the, the in-person check-in yet um, when the pandemic hit. So um, we, we did get you know, a pretty strong response from this. And I don't know if it was because um, you know, it's an interview that can get be completed kind of whenever they want, rather than trying to coordinate schedules with lots of different people for an in-person focus group. Um, or, you know, maybe it was just that this topic was really, you know, something that drove um, people to say, hey, I want my voice to be heard about, you know, what I feel about this and, and what went well and what didn't go well for me. So I, I don't really know exactly why um, that, that would have happened, but we definitely did get a, a really strong response and were able to you know, recruit all of our participants um, in a very short amount of time relative to some of the other projects that we've done in the past with this clinic. Okay, that's great. And you know, I think that to me is sort of the generalizable take home, I think that I think a lot of us could think about is, you know, is this the way to go going forward to really accelerate the pace? Yeah, definitely. That's what we're doing. Any other questions? Okay, hey, thank you so much for thank such an you. interesting uh, talk. It looks like there was one more that just came in oh. um, in the Q&A, perhaps. It says, do you think anxiety about coming to in-person appointments due to COVID has impacted care? How can we help autistic adults and others come back to the office when needed post-pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that is a good question. I do think um, for for a lot of folks that that, that is true. Um, I know, especially with this autistic adult population, the baseline anxiety, a lot of times with going into a healthcare setting already is kind of, is elevated. Um, and so, you know, having this extra, this extra factor of the, the risk of the pandemic can definitely be a challenge. Um, and I don't admittedly know exactly what, um, what, specific things to recommend. I can tell you from you know, the interviews that we've conducted that all of the patients and all of the caregivers that I've talked to were very, um, they, they expressed you know, how much they did appreciate telehealth, but all of them acknowledged you know, there are definitely gonna be things that I need to get care for that are just, I can't do through telehealth. Like if I need someone to look in my ear, if I have an ear infection, I need you know, someone to check my throat for strep, throat or you know, get blood work. So um, I think that probably it'll be, at least based on the interviews that we've conducted, kind of focusing on, you know, for this type of thing that you need, you know, medical care for, you really, you know, do need to come in. Um, that's the only kind of takeaway that I, I really have for that at this point. Terrific. Thank you so much for that. Thanks. Anything else coming in, Tiffany, before we... I think have? that is the last one that we have. So, okay, um, great. Thank you so much. And 
Brittany is our last speaker for the day. So we would like to thank everybody who attended today. Um, we will be meeting again on the 19th, a week from today. And we hope that you have the opportunity to join us then as we talk about all things tell us. So um, again, we appreciate all the time and effort our speakers gave us and talk in this discussion today about the rapid responses that we um, addressed through COVID. Thank you. I'm infected by a funky disposition. Let me take it out, whatever you do when. Better get up on the floor and get to moving. Oh, yeah. Can you feel the funk? Yeah. Can you feel the funk? Yeah. Say it one, two times and I feel the funk. Yeah. Can you feel the funk? Yeah. Can you feel the funk? Yeah. Can you feel the funk? Yeah. Say it one, two times and I feel the funk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you feel the funk? Yeah. Say one, two times and I feel the funk. Yeah. Oh.